A large and difficult concept to understand about the theory of common descent, without expanding your mind, is that of the genetic gradient. A human is not just a human. Differences are not just superficial. Genetic variety is huge, even in small populations. How we perceive things, brain chemicals, pattern seeking, and how cautious we are, who we're attracted to, who we perceive as our enemy, as well as the physiological and physical traits that live on a gradient with both extremes being rare and the majority being closer by degrees to the average. In a population, if a certain trait is more likely to allow that individual to mate and pass on their genes, then the number of individuals in the population with that trait is likely to go up. If an individual has a special trait that may not allow them to pass on material, but will make it more likely that their family will pass on genetic material, such as self-sacrifice or homosexuality, that trait will remain low in the gene pool, but will be available for adaptation if the need arises. Traits are self-regulating, for the most part in nature, and that trait lies on a stable gradient, or the species will vanish when the environment changes. The great Irish deer grew a huge rack of antlers to attract a mate, but at a certain point the rack became so huge in the population that they became a hindrance. When humans came along, they were easy to wipe out. If the antlers had been too small, though, they wouldn't have attracted mates, and therefore they wouldn't pass down their DNA, and when they were too large, they became unwieldy. This balance is why evolution is very slow to occur in a population unless there is an environmental shift. In the human realm, minor changes can cause diminishing varieties in our own populations. The Industrial Revolution kicked off allowing for more people the ability to reproduce with more resources. However, it was very centrist toward right-handed people. All equipment was built for right-handed people and the population of left-handers began to decline as they had to work harder than right-handers to be successful and therefore pass on their genes. Since we became aware of the difficulties lefties go through and change things up in factories, there has been a slow increase in left-handed people. In the 50s and 60s, teachers would force children to write with their right hand no matter what, and to adapt, the children would end up with terrible handwriting or writing nearly upside down to even write. It wasn't until we were made aware that left-handedness is natural and not just laziness that we were able to adapt our thinking to both styles. Homosexuality is the same way. If there was not enough homosexuals in an ancient population where group child raising was the norm, then there would be overpopulation and less childless hands and eyes to raise the children. Another alternative was, of course, infanticide, but that was reduced with homosexuals. If there were way too many homosexuals in a group, to the point where the idea of sex with the opposite sex completely repulsed them, then the group would die out from lack of reproduction. If it's Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve, then God must really hate hermaphrodites. If for some reason hermaphroditism became advantageous for the majority, then the majority would shift to that. When it comes to attraction, perception is everything. You know the old question posed about how what we call blue skies may appear completely different to another person? Dawkins has done studies on this very issue, but in animals and how they perceive the senses. A bat's sonic response may very well register in the brain as monochrome colors. Since there is a huge variety of smells that a dog can smell, the hardware of the dog's nose may very well convert the information into musical notes software. Smelling butt, drinking out of the toilet, and eating cat poop may seem disgusting to us because we know the health dangers, but to a dog, sniffing butts is important to recognition and is very accurate to the point of nearly fingerprint identification. Your pack may be your iPod, and eating cat poop may be a symphony of flavors in your mouth as a dog. Ever hear of synthasia? It is a condition, not a disorder, where the senses and perception do not match with the norm. These people can see flavors, smell shapes, or taste music. These people are on the outliers of the genetic gradient of human sensory perception. And if the environment changed and their perceptions became advantageous for reproduction, then the entire population would shift thanks to sexual selection until what was formerly normal is now the outlier waiting for the environment to change if the need arises. 
This is why tastes in what we like and what brings us dopamine rushes and what disgusts us varies between all of us. Part of it is psychological, of course. Certain things can be primed with memory tags linked to good and bad. However, just like how left-handers were disadvantaged because they had to try harder to be a good right-hander, having to adjust your taste when you are genetically predisposed to like certain things will require lots of work and energy to find something about that thing that disgusts you that will make it more tolerable or in some way enjoyable. This energy used and denial of yourself is extremely inefficient, and you could be using that willpower and energy on other things. In this series, we will be discussing the difficulties surrounding the understanding of gradients and their essential need for evolution to occur, how psychology and epigenetics affects these gradients, analyzing under what conditions one should use mental constructs to go against their genetics, and when to accept their uniqueness, and finally, how this diversity is both necessary for survival of a species and a society, and ideas of how to enhance synergy and efficiency between people of differing gradients.